Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. So um, we were talking about superconductivity. We just started talking about superconductivity. Um, do we guys see this slide? I believe so, right? Or no? And yes, Mister, we can say it. Yeah. No, no. Uh, did you see this slide last class or no? Did we? Yeah, no, we we didn't see it. I think that's the last one I got. This one. Yeah, next one, the one with the temperatures. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the last we saw. Okay. Okay. Then. Okay. Um. So just briefly, uh, so we were talking about superconductivity, and we were talking about this one, two type of superconductor, uh, superconductors, metal superconductors, and then. Um, ceramic superconductors, which we said are actually more important because obviously uh, their superconductivity is not, um, or the superconductivity effects don't don't happen at extremely low temperatures like um, in other materials. Um, and, and the thing that we said is that superconductivity doesn't only depend on temperature, but also on the magnetic field. Um, and remember, there is a critical, a critical magnetic field um, above which superconductivity will be destroyed. So if I exceed that critical uh, field strength, I will obviously destroy the superconductivity in my material. And we saw this relationship, right, um, where basically T is just the temperature and Tc becomes the critical temperature, right? And th th it's this relationship between critical temperature and the critical magnetic field strength. Um, and obviously, ceramic superconductors have a smaller critical magnetic field strength than metallic superconductors. And that's actually why um, ceramics more easily lose that superconductivity by a moderate magnetic field compared to metals, right? Um, and that's one of the big limits that, and why hasn't uh, the super, the ceramic superconductors market uh, has has grown significantly, and that's actually one of the of the big uh, challenges that, that the industry is facing. Is how do I make ceramic superconductors with a higher critical magnetic field strength? Um, so. Uh, basically, well, this is this is what I said. There is this big limiting factor uh, for ultra high field strength um, because obviously, you know, we have that limit, and obviously, if I go above that, then obviously, I'm, I will lose my super my superconductivity state. There is another uh, factor that is the critical current. So if you actually see now, we have three limiting factors for superconductivity, right? We have uh, temperature, we have magnetic field strength, and we have a critical current. So if I go above that, above those, or well, in, uh, either temperature, magnetic field strength, or critical current, I will lose, or my material will lose that superconducting state. Therefore, I actually need this combination of uh, let me use this temperature. I need to be um, at the right temperature and obviously don't exceed my critical temperature. I need to be below a critical current and I need to be below a magnetic field strength. So basically, the, the superconducting state of a material actually depends on these three things. And it's sort of forming this core, this sort of this eighth of a sphere, right? Between um, a THI diagram, so a temperature, magnetic field, current diagram, okay? And and actually, as, as I said, right, ceramic superconductors uh, have 
a lower magnetic field strength, a lower um, critical current, and obviously a higher temperature. So they do have a big advantage, which is a higher critical temperature, but unfortunately, they have um, lower magnetic field strength, well, crit critical magnetic field strength and critical current. And that's, as, as I said, that's, um, those are the big challenges that ceramic superconductors face nowadays. Okay, any questions so far, guys? Okay. So, type of types of superconductors. We have mainly two types. Uh, type one is when the destruction of the superconducting state by a magnetic field occurs sharply, so suddenly. I, I, I have suddenly that change from being uh, in a superconducting state, that means having zero resistivity, and jumping suddenly to a normal state where I, where I have a, a value of resistivity, right? A, a permanent value of resistivity. So that these type of materials actually are, are not very useful and, and they are not, for example, used for coils or, 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 or in superconducting magnets, right? Which is one of the main applications of superconductors. I have another type of superconductors uh, where this elimination of the superconducting state is gradual. So I don't have a sudden change. And, and you can see here, right, in the second graph here, I have zero, zero, zero resistivity, so that means superconducting state. And then I reach a critical magnetic field value, but then the, the, the change in resistivity is not sudden, right? It is, it's not like, in this case, where I have a sharp change, here it's more gradual. So it goes in the, the resistivity increases, but over a period of, of magnetic field strength, right? It's not sudden until it gets another value, another critical and definite value of magnetic field strength, and then it reaches the, the permanent resistivity value. So actually, and, and, and this is a big advantage because this difference between the second critical value and the first critical value um, actually can have a difference of 100 times, which is obviously very useful because that allows me a wider window um, of trying to keep or, or maintaining a still a superconducting state, even well, not a fully superconducting state, but at least I don't have that full resistivity uh, that I, I do when, when I reach normal state. And, and that is obviously after passing this um, second critical magnetic field strength. Um, so these this type of materials are, are the ones used for, for solenoids and, and coils in, in, super, in superconducting magnets, right? Um, these, these materials, the, the, the type two superconductors are, are basically all the ones we know. So ceramic superconductors, remember the YBCO, um, and metals as well, like uh, niobium, aluminum, um, vanadium, all superconductors, well, not all, but most superconductors, metal superconductors, and um, the ceramic superconductors are or belong to these type two superconductor groups. Okay. And it's actually quite interesting what's happening in, in type two superconductors. Okay. If you see um, actually what's happening between this interval, between um, the, the magnetic field strength one and, and cr the critical value two, that means in, in, in this region, we actually have a mixed state, as, as you can see, right? I, I do still have or, or try to maintain that of or, or the, the properties of the superconducting state, but I'm also, 
uh, traveling or going towards a normal state. So actually, I have a, that mixed state of superconductor and normal state. So when, when that happens, actually, what, what we see if, if we were to like study or capture the microstructure and what's happening inside the material, we will actually observe two regions. A superconducting matrix that in this graph, in, in the third graph, will be just uh, basically the empty space that you see there. That will be my matrix. And that will be the superconducting part of my structure. And then I have these small tubular circular regions that are called vortices, okay? vortices or fluxoids. These fluxoids or these vortices, they are in the normal state. And they actually carry the smallest possible unit of a magnetic flux. So they are the ones that are carrying the smallest possible unit of magnetic flux. Um, so I have this, this mixed state, right? I have these vortices surrounded by this large superconducting matrix or region. Okay. These fluxes, if you see actually the graph, these, uh, sorry, these fluxoids, they are aligned or they're parallel to the magnetic field. If you see the magnetic field direction, let's say it's going inside or, or towards the screen, wh whereas the, the fluxes are basically parallel to that, right? Um, and the, the, the good thing, and that's why uh, well, researchers and, and physicists think um, the, the, the material is still maintaining its superconductivity and it's also entering this normal region, is because these fluxes are not randomly distributed. They're, they're actually uh, quite nicely arranged, uh, as you see in, in the graph there, in the schematic there. They are nicely ordered, um, they are nicely arranged. They, they actually form like a, what's called a super lattice, right? Because I have a matrix, I have these fluxoids, and they're all nicely arranged. Now, there, there is one extra point to, to mention about this, um, this dual matrix, or actually this, this dual um, microstructure, right? If we're talking, or, or we said that the fluxes, fluxes are the ones that are carrying the smallest possible unit of, my, uh, of, of sorry, of flux. Um, one will therefore expect that the, the current that is flowing, right, uh, perpendicular to this flow switch, will just go without obstruction, right, without any interruption. Um, and therefore, one will say, wait, if, if they are nicely arranged, right, because they are nicely arranged, so if I have a current flowing perpendicular to this flow switch, there shouldn't be any obstacle, and therefore there should be superconductivity, right? The thing is that the current in an electron magnet flows at a right angle to the magnetic field. So I have my magnetic field, again, going parallel to the fluxoids. And I have the current um, that will be traveling at a right angle, so 90 degrees to the magnetic field. When that happens, I do create something called a Lorentz force. What does this force does? Well, it pushes the fluxoids perpendicular to the current, like entirely perpendicular. And therefore, when, when the, fluxoids, the fluxoids are moving, they eventually will act as barriers or obstacles for uh, electrons that are traveling, for drifting electrons. So, Again, and, and that's why and that, that explains basically why I have this mixed state. Because again, if I have just that and everything will be perfect, then I will have electrons traveling freely and then I will have a superconducting state. The thing is, and, and, and that is the, the magic, I guess, of this transition region, 
Because when I have the magnetic field, I have the current that will basically push the fluctuates perpendicular to them, therefore creating this force that you see there called Lorentz force. That will push my fluxoid to move. And during that movement, obviously, if I have an electron traveling, maybe I'm moving, and electrons will collide with that. And obviously, we have obstacles. Therefore, I don't have that superconducting state. So I still have some superconductivity properties. But because of those collisions, I also, I'm also entering that normal region. And that's why I have this um, transition region. Um, I can avoid this? Yes, definitely. Uh, if I can pin the fluxes to their positions, that means if I don't allow them to move, right? Because again, what the, what the force is doing is moving them. If I pin them, if I don't allow them to move, and that can be done, for example, introducing uh, microstructural inhomogeneities. Um, so that means just introducing in my matrix certain um, additives that are not um, homogeneous, that are basically not compatible with my matrix, that will make my fluxoids to stay where they are. That will allow my, 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 my fluxoids to basically don't move. And that is called fluxoid pinning. And that it's mainly achieved by heat treatment or by plastic deformation. Um, for example, one of the main superconductors in, um, in the market, it's this, right? It's the tin niobium uh, superconducting magnets. And that, uh, for example, this, uh, this material, uh, goes through a wire drawing process. So, you know, remember the drawing process. So basically they're extruded. It's actually a drawn. They're actually drawn, but remember, um, in a wire shape. So remember there's a huge plastic deformation to do that. And obviously there's a previous heat treatment for that. Um, and so through that, um, you get this fluxoid pinning and, and therefore, uh, at least this transition region will be, um, I would say, a bit more, uh, le less, how can I say, it, it, it won't be as visible or this effect won't be as visible. There will, be, there will still be a transition definitely because there has to be the transition from a normal to a superconducting state that has to happen. So and from superconducting to the normal state that has to happen. But um, it won't be so evident and so uh, impactful, right? It will be trying to keep more my superconducting state. And, and that's quite important. So basically, if I see this, that will be moving or shifting my uh, critical value one. Let me see where am I? So moving this value towards the right. And I don't know, let's say somewhere reaching there, right? Because I'm pinning my fluxoids, and therefore um, I do have that super, I still retain that superconducting state. Up to a certain point where I definitely can't do anything else, um, which is reaching a, a second critical magnetic field strength value. Any questions, guys? Obviously, it's quite um, difficult to achieve this fluxoid pinning in ceramics, right? Um, why do you think is that? Because as I said, you can achieve this, for example, in tin niobium superconductors or metallic superconductors, but 
by, but why do you think it's so difficult to get these in ceramic superconductors? Because you can get these in, in ceramic superconductors. Even though they have the same, the same arrangement, which is the superconducting matrix and the fluxes, why you can't get fluxoid pinning in ceramics? Um, the return of the question. All right. Um, um, okay. So I think, I don't know if I understood it well. So as, as I like, let's say, for working. Can you hear me? I can't, uh, I can't hear you well, Nati. What about that? What about now? That, that sounds better. Okay. So I was, I was answering you that, um, okay, so as as I cold work a, let's say, a, a piece of metal, I am pinning the structures, right? So therefore, the mixing, the mixed state between the superconductivity and normal state, it's, it's uh, let's say, it's fever. But it doesn't mean, I mean, it, it means that this mixed state, it's it's bigger, but it doesn't mean that it, it has higher conductivity. It would actually have more resistivity, right? Because I'm called working. No, no, no. Well, actually, I, I mean, you, you will not change the resistivity once it reaches the, the normal state. Um, so you're not changing. If I go back to the graph, you're not changing this value. So uh, let me... This is, that will be the superconducting state, right? Superconducting state. This will be the mixed state, and that will be the normal state, right? So you're not changing anything. When you do that, you're not changing anything when you are, uh, once you reach the normal state. Once you reach this value, you're not changing anything. Actually, the only thing you're doing here is pinning your fluxoids so you still or you sort of block those collisions or avoid the collisions of certain drift, drifting electrons with sorry with my fluxoids and therefore um i i am allowing electrons to move freely and therefore i still maintain for a longer period, that fully superconducting state. So all I'm doing is just extending my superconducting state. And therefore, this HC1 value, I'm just moving it towards my right. But eventually, I will reach a point where I do have a critical value. I mean, uh, and, and I can't do anything else. I I do have that critical value and there will be that change towards the normal state. It's just that that first critical value where I uh, started creating this Lorentz force and, and, and electrons colliding uh, with my fluxoids, I can extend that or I can get a bigger value of that first critical value, a larger value. So basically, in this graph, all I'm doing is just shifting. And let's say I will get something like that. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to draw with yellow. So I'll have something like this. Oops. Ah, what happened? Wait. Yeah, it's just um, I'm kind of confused because um, uh, I thought that when you um, cold work a piece or, where you, or, or when you add uh additives you uh lower the i mean sorry you um increase the resistivity because because you have like this, this um that is steady state or you, you could like um no no that superconducting state is not a steady state it's superconducting state ss is superconducting state so no you're but, not you you you're you're not changing so in the superconducting state, you have zero resistivity. That is superconductivity. Superconductivity means zero resistivity. 
and, and you're not changing anything uh, by, by let, let's say, why coding, or by, by code working, you're not changing anything in the normal state. You will get at the end from that transition. Remember, this is just comparing superconductors, right? Or, um, or materials that exhibit superconductivity. You will not change anything once it reaches the normal state. It will have the same resistivity. The only thing you're changing is, is just extending this window of, uh, or yeah, just the, the, the first point where it gets, um, or where it, the transition towards the normal state begins. That's it. Is that more clear? Kinda, but um, I think it will get clearer as, as we go on the class. Sorry? But it's kinda clear, but I think it will get clearer as we go through the class. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, I, I go back to my question. Um, why can I not get fluxoid pinning in, in ceramics? Well, it's simple because remember, ceramics have a critical temperature that's a lot higher than metallic superconductors, right? They have a um, uh, usually, let's say ceramic superconductors have 170, 150 Kelvin. Um, whereas remember, metallic superconductors, they have at like 20, 30 Kelvin, right? It's very low temperature. So once you increase the temperature, right? So you are at, let's say, 100, 120 Kelvin. Even though you, you can do this heat treatment or this plastic deformation, Remember that the higher the temperature, the more mobile the atoms are, right? So you will induce lattice vibrations. Once you, you are at those temperatures, you will already have lattice vibrations. So even though you can do a heat treatment and plastic deformation to try to fix or ping your, sorry, ping your fluctuates, because of the lattice vibrations, you, still, you will still have some movement, sorry, and therefore electrons, uh, or well, my, my fluxoid will move because of these thermally induced vibrations and therefore electrons will collide with those fluxoids and as a result, I won't have um, that effect of fluxoid pinning because I'm, I'm basically, I still have it due to thermally induced, induced vibrations, I still have motion of my fluxoids and they are not pinned. Any questions, guys? I have a question. Yes. What happens after the normal state? Is there any way to regain the superconductive property once the material reaches yeah, yeah. the normal state? It's reversible. So you can decrease the temperature. Uh, well, you actually have these three combination, right? Yeah, I mean, the superconductivity is reversible. It's not a one thing. Um, so if you exceed the critical magnetic field, and, and you go to normal state, well, you decrease that magnetic field and you go back to superconducting state. If you, the, if you exceeded the, um, the critical current, okay, you go to normal state, but you decrease the current, okay, you go back to superconducting state, same with temperature. Okay, if I'm at 300 Kelvin, okay, I lost superconductivity, okay. I go back to 100 Kelvin, I still, got, I, I, I regain superconductivity. It's definitely reversible. So I just go back to the conditions where my material will have superconductivity and I will have my material in a superconducting state. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Go ahead. So you're telling me that uh, we can go back from this uh, and forward between these uh, states but isn't there going to be a hysteresis? I mean, the, the material will eventually lose their the capability to superconduct. Yes, um, after a certain time, yes. If I, if I keep changing, if I keep changing suddenly, 
Um, so if, I, if I'm changing constantly, right? If I'm changing, okay, right now I, I have this material at 200 Kelvin and then, um, or 100 Kelvin, and then two minutes after I, I, I put it at 300 and then I go back two minutes later to, to 200 Kelvin. And then if I do those changes repeatedly all the time, then obviously, yes, the material will start having, um, especially because they're not completely pure. If I, if I will have a, com a completely pure material, even, even if I do that, I, very likely, and, and that's why they're trying to synthesize these materials, um, the material won't exhibit any loss of, of the superconducting state. But because there are, there are obviously always impurities and things like that, um, those will start affecting the matrix, and and obviously I will eventually start losing the, some superconductivity, here, and and I might um, eventually lose the superconducting state. But um, that will happen if I keep changing repeatedly. If not, um, my my material will still exhibit superconductivity, um, and that's actually again one one of the um, of, of the challenges that, that the superconducting industry is, is facing, right? How do I uh, maintain this? Even though for the applications they need, actually, they, they don't need to be changing this constantly. For the applications of superconductors, they are usually at a constant um, or changing but very small variations of, of current, magnetic field, and temperature. So. It is a challenge, but let's say it's not a big need the industry has now. Um, I guess the big need actually is, is, is how do I make superconduct or sorry, how do I make a ceramic superconductors have um, more, uh, not, well, I guess not too brittle uh, so they can actually support these, these high current densities and, and, and the high environment instability, let's say. Um, so the, and, and obviously that, that that's a big challenge because obviously we're interested in ceramic superconductors because they have higher critical temperatures, but we have those those two challenges that are a small current and the small critical magnetic field strength. Um, but yeah, if you, regarding going back to your question, it's not a big need. I mean, superconductors are used. Let's say in a in a per in a permanent condition when I when I where I don't need this constant change of 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 conditions. But yes, I can definitely go back and eventually at some point if I keep changing uh, the conditions, then yes, I I will or I might lose superconductivity. Any other questions, guys? What external factors could affect the superconductive property? External factors. Um, I mean, the, the main three factors that that regulate superconductivity are the current, the magnetic field strength, and the temperature. So. If I exceed the critical values of any of those, then yeah, I, I will lose superconductivity. Those are the main factors. Then, yes, I, I might have certain impurities, for example, that might block, um, especially in type two superconductors, right? They might have certain uh, impurities that instead of actually pinning my, my fluxoids, I, I might actually uh, start, to, start to block uh, drifting electrons. Uh, and that obviously will will affect uh, the superconducting state. Um, but yeah, external factors will be only temperature, current, and magnetic field strength. Uh, okay. um, when when I apply a magnetic field or a current on on the superconductor conductor, um, once I I take take out this magnetic field. Is there a remaining field, like when you do, uh, let's say, non-destructive uh, test on metals, there's a remaining field that you have to take out with, uh, 
uh, a contrary direction of the card. Do I have to do the same here? Well, if you if you if you remove the field, uh, you you lose the superconducting state, and you go back to a, to a metallic behavior. If it's a ceramic, you you go back to a fully ceramic normal behavior. There's no risk to have a remaining magnetic field due to the to the stasis. I mean, yes, you you do have it. Yes, you do have it, but uh, that. That means that you, that you go back to the normal state. So you, you're not longer in the superconducting state. And yes, you, you will have um, a remaining magnetic field, but that that actually makes your material to go back to the normal state. If you remove the, the, the magnetic field, you're just going back uh, to the normal state. Okay. Yes, you will have a residual, yes. That doesn't affect if you want to go back to the superconducting state. That that will not be affected. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go more to the theory of superconductivity, right? How how is superconductivity explained? I mean, we 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 said okay, you don't have uh, or you have zero resistance. We saw the type of superconductors, but actually. How is superconductivity? How does superconductivity happen? And actually, for ceramics, there is still not an explanation or a valid explanation. Um, lots of papers, lots of research going on uh, to try to explain how superconductivity happens in ceramics, but that's still a, a big challenge. Uh, but at least the BCS theory is capable to explain it very, very well. Uh, why superconductivity happens in metals or in this metallic compound. And for that, one has to accept or take for granted the existence of a pair of electrons that is called a copper pair. And this pair of electrons actually has a lower energy than two individual electrons. So if I have one electron and I have another electron, um, obviously the, 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 the energy of them will be higher than this copper pair. So basically than these two electrons that are paired. Okay, why is that? Or, or why, how, how does that happen to explain, or how does that help, sorry, to, to explain superconductivity? Let's imagine an electron, and then we'll, we'll see an schematic that might, might help to, to understand things better. But let's imagine an electron in a metal at zero Kelvin. Because we are at zero Kelvin, this electron actually perturbs the lattice very slightly. Right? It's not a big influence because we're at zero Kelvin or at very low temperature. So if that electron starts drifting through the crystal, so it starts traveling through the crystal, the perturbation is only momentary, right? And it's slight. It's not really affecting a big environment inside the crystal. So once it passes, an electron, once it passes, an ion that has been displaced, reverts back. So the electron, I have my crystal, right? My crystal is staying in one position. I have my electron traveling. It perturbs the lattice, yes, but only slightly and momentarily. Once it has passed, what, what happens with my crystal? And obviously the ions right inside the crystal, it just go, they just go back to the position, to the original position. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like a small spring. Right, where it's it just because of the electron drifting, I, 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 my, my lattice or my crystal moves a bit, and obviously the ion inside, the ions inside move a bit, but once it passed, oh, effect is no longer there, so go back to my position. So again, it's basically the ion like being uh, held by springs, right? The thing is, 
But once it, it, it goes back to the original site, the, this ion comes back to the original site. It doesn't just go back and sit there. It actually overshoots and it starts oscillating around its rest position. So it basically just starts moving slightly around the position where it, it was originally. Well, that um, effect of an electron perturbing slightly the crystal, reverting back my ion, and then having my ion to uh, oscillate slightly around the, the rest position, around the equilibrium or the original position, that creates a phonon. And that is a phonon. This vibration of an ion around its rest position is what we call a phonon. We, I think we briefly talk about that maybe, I think in ceramics, um, but that's a phonon. And so is this, this phonon goes, or so basically this vibration, that, that's a phonon, right? This vibration interacts quickly with a second electron. So a second electron comes and obviously interacts with that phonon. And that electron takes advantage of the deformation, of that deformation, of, of that oscillation, and lowers its own energy. So once I lower, or once the electron lowers its energy, it can emit another phonon. And that phonon obviously interacts with the first electron. And is that passing back and forth of phonons, which couples the two electrons together and brings, brings them to a lower energy state, and that's what we call a copper pair. So basically, just to repeat, one electron perturbing the crystal, um, the ions that got perturbed go back to its origin to their original position, but start oscillating. That is a phonon. That phonon, another electron comes, interacts with that vibration, interacts with that phonon takes advantage of that deformation, of that oscillation, lowers its own energy. Once it lowers the energy, it can emit another phonon. And, and that phonon will interact with electron one. And therefore, we have paired two electrons that are interacting back and forth with um, the phonons that they created. And therefore, I have a copper pair. Like this. That is basically a schematic of, of a copper pair. I have two electrons, right? Electron one and electron two, as you see there. Let me see where my, okay. oops. Uh, electron one and electron two. They are displacing or they are perturbing the ions inside a crystal. The ions will move, um, they start oscillating and they create these phonons, right? And the phonons, the phonons are basically vibrations, right? Inside the crystal. Um, and those vibrations interact with the um, electrons. Sorry. And because of that, obviously I have this pair of electrons that have a lower energy than two individual electrons by themselves. Sorry. And that's why, because they have low energies, or, or a lower energy than an individual than an individual electron will have. That's why are, they are free to move inside the crystal. Or well, free, obviously, creating these these phonons and moving back and forth, and obviously carrying electro or well carrying uh, or conducting all around freely the crystal with zero resistivity. It's, a, it's an abstract concept, I know. Um, might be difficult to, to visualize, and that's, again, that's the, the challenge of quantum mechanics. But this is the, the, the theory that has been accepted by, by everyone by now, 
that can at least in a nice way explain what's happening or, or why superconductivity is happening, at least in metals. In ceramics, this is a lot more difficult because remember in ceramics, we don't really have electrons, right? Or, or we do have electrons, but um, they're not free like in metals and therefore it, it's, it's, it's more challenging to explain what's happening or why superconductivity is happening in, metal, in ceramics, sorry. Uh, question so far, guys, is, is, is this clear? Okay. If, if you don't have questions, I'm going to ask you a question. Who do you think are those electrons, or what are those electrons that form copper pairs? What electrons do you think are the ones that form these copper pairs? Uh, they should be the valence electrons. Mm. Okay, but you always go back to valence electrons. Yes, no, no, no. remember that it, it's so broad to, to talk about valence electrons, right? Um, There are a certain group of electrons that that might be here, and that definitely are in the valence elect or are part of the valence electrons. But it's not that all valence electrons will be there, or not maybe not even only valence electrons. Maybe free flowing electrons, whether they are valence or or not. Okay. Maybe uh, free flying electrons, even though they are balanced electrons or not. Would, uh, would what electrons? Free flying. Free flying electrons. I mean, even even though they are they are balanced electrons or not. Even though they're balanced, and uh, I, I can't hear you the first part, but okay, never mind. I'm always talking about this concept. Of Fermi energy. It's actually all electrons that are on the Fermi surface. If we do that Fermi circle or that Fermi sphere, will be all electrons at the Fermi surface. And obviously, the pair will be formed by electrons that have sorry, opposite momentum and opposite spins, right? So if I have an electron here, the pair will be the opposite of that, right? But obviously, they both must be to the Fermi surface. So basically, these electrons form a cloud of copper pairs, right? And these copper pairs are moving cooperatively through the crystal. So if you want to understand how the superconducting state looks like, it's actually, you could say, it's an ordered state of the conduction electrons. So in a normal state, in a metal, I do have conducting electrons. I do have electrons in the, in the Fermi surface, but I don't have these pairs of electrons or and therefore, all electrons are moving in different ways, different directions, but they are not moving cooperatively. And that's why I do have conductivity, but I don't have superconductivity. Whereas in the superconducting state, I have these electrons that have opposite momentum and opposite spins forming a pair, a copper pair, and because of that, these pairs of electrons are moving cooperatively through the crystal. And you're saying, okay, you go there, you go there, you go there, you go there. So everyone occupies a position. They don't collide with each other. 
there are there there are there is no scattering of electrons or there is no scattering on the lattice atoms and therefore zero resistance superconducting state Is this clear? Clear or no? If I will have the normal state, Basically, I will have thermal induced vibrations of, of lattice, I will have phonons, and there will be a scattering a, a lot between electrons, phonons, and therefore that's why, again, that's why I have conductivity, but not superconductivity. Okay. I think yeah, Mr. yeah, I have a question. As you said, um, the electrons that make this are only those that are paired in the Fermi surface, in this Fermi surface. Now, there can be more electrons in the Fermi surface that are not paired, therefore not being Cooper pairs. Um, there will there will always be a, a paired electrons in, in the in the Fermi surface uh, because just look at the graph. I mean, if you have an electron here, you will have the opposite of that electron here. Because the Fermi surface is occupied by electrons, it's fully occupied by electrons. At least for, I mean, obviously, if we're talking about a superconductor, if, if you don't have a material that has superconductivity, then yeah, definitely, you, you will not have. And that's why materials that are not superconductors don't have these copper pairs. But if we're talking about superconductivity, the electrons all electrons at the Fermi side at the Fermi surface will be paired with an electron that has uh, the its opposite momentum and its opposite spin. Yeah, then yeah, you can definitely have not not pair electrons, but then you don't have superconductivity. Any other questions? Um, yes, I have one question. Also, I don't have very clearly the, the concept of a phonon, and this is my, my problem. Um, in, the sim in simple terms, actually, that's one of the of the most difficult concepts in, in quantum mechanics. Um, but in simple terms, a phonon is a lattice vibration. It's not exactly that, but it's basically it's just the oscillation of a particle in in the superconducting state. It's considered that the particle is an ion that is oscillating around like a like a pendulum. It's oscillating um, around its rest position. So that's a phonon. It's, it's just a, a vibration inside the lattice. That's the, the, the simplest term you can, or the simplest explanation uh, that uh, explains what a phonon is. OK, it's like a, a harmonic oscillator. Yeah. Yeah, basically it's that. It's literally a phonon. It's it's a lattice uh, vibration. It's just um, in in this case because it's it, it generally a particle, a vibration of a particle. In, in this case, to explain the superconductivity, uh, and it is the ion, the one that is or an ion, the one that is moving around its rest position. So it's oscillating, um, and and that is. Also, a phonon. I mean, a phonon is in general a particle that is oscillating inside the lattice. That's a okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and this is the interesting, and that's why I'm saying this. This explains superconductivity very nicely because at low temperatures, right? And and also this again, this is what uh, why superconductivity is explained nicely in metals. Because at low temperatures, we have these copper pairs forming. What will happen at at at, at higher temperatures? So if I if I break 
my superconducting state. So if I go at higher temperatures, there will be a strong interactions between electrons and phonons. So this disturbance of the electrons moving through the lattice, it won't just cause a nice phonon to oscillate and therefore uh, forming the pairs and, and interacting back and forth phonons and electrons and, and, and all moving cooperatively to, to, to produce the superconducting state. Actually, because again, I have higher temperatures, more mobility of atoms, the interactions between the phonons and the electrons will be so strong that will actually lead me to collisions. So electrons actually will start colliding with 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 phonons, and electrons will even start and sorry, and phonons will even start colliding with another phone with other phonons, and therefore I lose the superconducting state. So this theory actually explains very nicely again what happens or with superconductivity in metals. Because it explains what happens at low temperature, so when I have the superconducting state, and what happens at higher at high temperatures when I lose that superconducting state, and I usually lose it because this um, I, I don't longer or I no longer form these copper pairs because this interaction between phonons and electrons actually is not forming copper pairs anymore. It's actually what's what's happening is actually um, causing a scattering of electrons, and therefore I have a normal state. That's why actually, and, and, and if you think about it, poor conductors in the normal state are potential candidates, and, and that's why also ceramics are like that. Poor conductors in the normal state are nice candidates for superconductivity at low temperatures. Whereas very good conductors. That's why that's why copper is not a con a, a very uh, a superconductor. Very good conductors. They are actually no in the normal state. They're not candidates for superconductivity. You don't see superconductors superconductivity of of copper, for example. You see superconductivity in ceramics, which you know at normal state they're usually not good conductors. Teacher, can you repeat that? I I couldn't get it. So why copper is not a a good superconductor at lower temperatures? Well, it's not a it's not a superconductor. Copper is oh, not okay. a superconductor. Because in general, if you think about this concept of, of the Fermi surface forming copper pairs, it actually must happen. Or what this is telling me, this copper theory, um, sorry, this copper pair, uh, the, that is the, the BCS theory, this BCS theory is telling me that for superconductivity, I need this copper pair for this copper pair of electrons forming at low temperatures. But at high temperatures, I will have these interactions between phonons and electrons. That will actually make that will actually make my material a poor conductor at normal in the normal state, because I have so many collisions that my, my material will become a super a poor conductor. So if I have a good conductor in the normal state, will very likely won't uh, yeah will very likely not form these copper pairs at low temperatures and therefore will not be a superconductor. And that's actually the general that's a general rule. If a material is a good conductor in at, at normal temperature, it won't be a superconductor. Whereas if a material is a poor conductor in the normal state, it's very likely, not all of them, but it's very likely that might become a, a superconductor at low temperatures. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so what, what happens with, with Fermi energy? What, what happens with the Fermi energy uh, in, in superconductors, right? Because we, we just mentioned, and we said that a copper pair should have a lower energy than two ampere electrons, right? So if I have two ampere electrons like moving freely there, they will have a higher energy than, than this copper pair of electrons, right? That's why actually the Fermi energy in the superconducting state 
um, is actually lower than that for the normal state. So, and, and if you see now my gap, I actually have a higher gap now, right? Because my, my Fermi energy will be here, right? For the normal state. And here will be the, the, the next band and obviously I will have that energy gap. But for the superconducting state, my uh, Fermi energy is actually lower. It's, it's actually, in, in, it's not, let's say, there's not a, a, a definite or, or a specific calculation. There hasn't been. Um, uh, let's say um, a specific calculation to say, okay, what's the value of the Fermi energy at the superconducting state? But um, people do consider that it will obviously be lower than that. So it will be probably around here or maybe even around here. But the, the, the idea is that it will obviously be lower because, again, the, these copper pair of electrons have a lower energy than two freely ampere electrons. Okay. Oof, okay. We haven't, um, okay. I mean, that was an interesting discussion. Okay, let's go to, actually, yeah, let's time for a coffee break and then I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, okay, coffee break time, guys. Who's in charge of the coffee break today? It's me. Okay, Brian, please. Uh, teacher, you can see the lights? No. Um. Okay, I can see them now. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we talk about the electric properties and material and uh, how it relate with the threshold energy and uh, energy gap. Well, uh, first, what is the photoelectric phenomenon? The photoelectric phenomenon is, is its effect is which the particle of light called photons impact with the electron of metal uh, is impact with the electron of a metal uh, transmitting energy that a load is the most causing electron current. Uh, this phenomenon is used uh, in plants that use uh, solar panels, which retain the light energy uh, from the sun, transforming into electricity. Uh, when a sheet of material, uh, simply uh, a metal, is exposed to a light uh, with a specific frequency, for example, the sunlight, electricity is produced uh, in, this, in the in the body. Um, when the light uh, travels, we have uh, like a wave and an impact with a surface. The energy uh, that have the photon is transmitted uh, to the electrons, and but the phenomenon is uh, is a little different because the energy is transmitted to the electron, uh, but the they have a energy restriction for the to the begin the move and begin the electric current. In this light, we can see the energy available is uh, the is equal to the energy photon. Okay, the, that is the energy is the energy that uh, transmit the sunlight uh, in this in the form like a wave. But the energy restriction uh, is the mm, is that uh, the energy barriers they present by the something colored threshold of energy. What is the threshold energy? The threshold energy is uh, uh, correspond 
to the minimum frequency of the light incident surface of a material for the electric photoelectric effect to take a place. The emission of the electron from the surface of a material occurs. As the atoms of material are different, so is the energy needed for electrons to be emitted. We can observe how the threshold energy influences the energy that can be transmitted uh, to where uh, its value decreases. Is the threshold energy ever? Sorry, if the threshold frequency is lower with the same energy of the photon, more energy can be transmitted. Semiconductors are the ideal material for this condition since they have uh, relative low values. And therefore, for each material, there will be a minimum energy value that the incident photon uh, must have for the emission of an electrode to occur. The, that minimum energy value is known as metal extraction, uh, work or threshold energy or working function. We can see it here uh, with a minute. We can see here this value uh, is a threshold frequency that the energy for the have to uh, need need to uh, need to be uh, more that the threshold frequency for the electric for the current uh, electric uh, begins in the first case in the in the left the energy obtained for the photons is less than the energy of the threshold so no the electrons are emitted no current is produced in the second in the second and the third uh, case uh, the energy the energy of the photon exceeds uh, that the threshold with the difference that the magnitude of, of the available energy is much bigger in the third case. Consider to take into account about the energy of the photon. As the amplitude uh, of the light reminded, as the frequency of the light increased, the number of the photon absorbed by the metal remained constant. Therefore, uh, the radio of the electron eject out of the metal also remained constant. Our study was done uh, where the results were completely inspected. Science is possible the move the electron when light and signs of the energy in a beam of light is related to its intensity. Classical physics will predict that more intense beam uh, of light uh, will eject electron with greater energy that, uh, than a less intense beam regardless uh, of frequency. However, this was not the case. In the graph, uh, I can be seen uh, that the increase in the frequency of light uh, does not alter uh, to the current produced when they exceed the frequency of the threshold. Uh, right here, uh, wait a minute, okay, right here. Um, on the other hand, the amplitude of the light did increase the current produced of the frequency higher than the threshold, but the energy remained constant. Here. Um, the relation the energy between energy threshold and the energy gaps is a uh, direct proportional. Why? Uh, um, but uh, something uh, that uh, helps when the selection material for the electric plate is the relation between uh, threshold energy and gap energy. When compared different materials, it can be highlighted the mat data material that has a lower gap energy will be very candidate for you for electric application because the this way that the transmit energy will increase. Actually, maybe uh, these results aren't the typical. Most elements have threshold frequency that uh, are ultraviolet and only few dips down like enough the, to be green or yellow frequency. The materials with the lowest threshold frequencies are all semiconductor and some have threshold frequency in the infrared region of the spectrum. About the equation uh, here, uh, the relation that exists between the two energy mentioned is to, to certain equations such as we. We know that uh, how uh, the most relation uh, certain terms about the function of energy gap and the function that the speed of life uh, as a frequency and the magnitude of the wavelength. 
All this equation mentioned above is ultra right relation mentioned above. Uh, if someone wants, I could show the equation to be able to obtain the relation between uh, both energies, but uh, we have the half result that relation. And um, material selection using true energy, we could see uh, different semiconductors materials and the energy gap. Uh, uh, energy gap respective about these materials. And actually uh, is uh, the German study uh, for a new application for a uh, semi uh, for for electric uh, properties and um, will be in the future used in panel solar. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Brian. Uh, a note for everyone. You can come and read um, a paper in, in these presentations. Uh, you can definitely get all the information from a paper because that's the idea, right? Go and research on a topic and, and, and present the topic. Uh, but you can't come and read entirely what, what the paper says. Um, you obviously have to synthesize the information, even put it in your words and, and try to explain what's, what's happening. Um, uh, teacher, uh, this is a new paper, a uh, only paper. Uh, I have a uh, begin with this with uh, the property electric, and finally I found a relation the energy threshold with the frequency threshold and the wavelength pressure for uh, for the energy gap. Okay. Um, even even more, right? It, it was it was evident, and, and this is not just for you, Brian, uh, but it, it's for everyone. It was evident. It was evident you were actually reading everything what the what what the papers said. Uh, you were clearly use uh, you were clearly using language of a paper, um, and that's not correct, guys. You you have to come and synthesize and 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 summarize the, the information you you're reading right um and, and present the importance of that information um I, I didn't quite understand brian when when you were talking about the energy gap how, how does the table that you present there help uh to understand this this whole relationship of the photoelectric effect uh, uh, the questions the the table there uh here yes and um, this is a, a, a table uh, we ha uh, i found in a paper the table is related uh, so the energy gap with the respective semiconductor materials but no more it's just energy gap yes i mean I, I can definitely see i can see the density the atomic number and the energy gap but uh -huh. you use you you're presenting this table for a purpose i guess what is that purpose of presenting this table uh well uh see i forget it it's the, the germany for example we can uh, found in the internet about the energy gap uh, the semiconductor cells uh, because uh, if uh, with with the relation uh, between internet energy threshold and energy gap is directly proportional uh, the energy gap, the silice, is uh, more higher uh, than the energy, the Germany. Sorry. So uh, I found in the Germany uh, for the application for, for electric properties and uh, is a better semiconductor material. And is this the reason because I have now a study for future application in the panel solar. It's more effective than silice because the energy gap is is Sorry. lower what, than this Germany. What mat what material is 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 or is being researched for for solar panels? You said silicon. No, no, no. Uh, Germany. Germanium. Germanium, pardon. Sorry. Okay. It now, uh, it now is now study for the future application, but uh, the the very material now uh, for the different uses is silices. 
Can can you repeat that, please? Uh, the germanium is a material the, that uh, study now for the future application for the better property for for the electric effect. That, but now uh, in different application uh, uses uh, the silicium uh, for the the better material now. But in the future we have we call uh, weight uh, panel uh, panel with germanium common with uh, semiconductor material principle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you, you you're saying that germanium might be a better candidate um, than silicon for solar panels and photoelectric applications, right? Yeah. The reason is that the energy gap is lower. That the the, the germanium is lower, and we can see here the the equation about the the threshold energy with the energy gap, and if we could see this, the energy threshold is the barrier for the energy current is uh, is produced in the in the in the panel solar well and with material with a lower uh, energy threshold we have uh, more energy uh, available uh, for this effect and a better uh, better application for the panel solar with uh, more energy okay um Okay, I, I just want to make a note on that. Actually, there are solar panels that uh, already have germanium on them and not silicon. So germanium is already being utilized in solar panels, not uh, to big a scale. Why? Because it's very expensive to produce it and because we don't have a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, and then, yeah, you, you explained the, the photoelectric effect very nicely. You, you even mentioned the work function, even, you, even though you didn't explain what the work function is. Um, so, guys, remember, it doesn't have to be a high-end topic what you present here. It doesn't have to, to be the absolutely latest research on a topic. You can definitely present, um, well, don't come to present something that is outdated, but it doesn't have to be the latest topic or the, the, the most trendy topic on, on, on internet regarding um, of this field of, of properties of materials. Um, and remember to give it the, or remember to focus on what I ask for. Um, this is not a lecture. This is not meant to be a lecture, the, the coffee break. The idea here is you to come and be able to present the research or the short research you did on a topic or a, a given functional property and talk about how or what the problem is or what the problem was if the problem is solved and show the approach that the researchers made or the company if it's a case study the company made to solve the problem and then you relate how that solution um, is basically or has the principles of, you know, using these concepts of functional properties of materials. So remember, it's not as free as last term, like you, uh, because it was quite open, right? Last term for for um, metals and ceramics. In all the presentations I I I I've, I've, I've seen so far are like last last terms presentations. Remember, they're not so open right now. They're open in terms of you can go and choose any topic as long as it's related to functional properties. But you don't have to come here and talk about the property or, or explain, you know, in detail the property. What I ask you for is a more engineering point of view. And that means, OK, what the problem is or what the problem was. How these, how are the researchers or how, how is the company approaching that problem? And obviously that solution, that approach has to be related to the functional properties or to the principles of different uh, properties and materials. So 
keep in mind that for uh, those that will be presenting in the future, guys. Uh, and remember to synthesize and summarize and put the information in your own words. Um, okay, I'm going to choose the person for next week. Georgina. Georgina hasn't presented yet, right? Does anyone remember? Georgina there? No? Well, I, I don't think she has presented, so please let Georgina know that she has to present uh, next week, guys. Um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay. So let's talk about the band structure. Um, actually, wait. Oops. Am I missing? Wait. Uh, oh yeah. No, actually, yeah. Okay. Enough for superconductivity. Now it's time to jump into semiconductors. Let's talk about the di different types of semiconductors and, 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 uh, and obviously the theory um, behind semiconductors. So and let's actually start with the band structure in semiconductors, even though actually there is a difference between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors, and we'll talk about that. So what happens in semiconductors? Remember, we, we, we called when we were talking about these energy bands that form in materials, we call the M band and the N band. Remember that? Well, actually, we're now going to give them names to those bands. And actually, we're going to distinguish between these two bands. And the lower band will be what we call a valence band. And the band above that will be the conduction band. Semiconductors, they have a completely filled valence band. So they have full electrons in the valence band, but in, the, in, that, in that next higher band that is called the conduction band, it's free. They don't have any electrons. If we go back to what we saw in metals, Metals have a partially filled valence band, and they, and they also have electrons in the conduction band. So they have actually a partially filled valence band and a partially filled conduction band. And that's what gives me um, electrical conduction in metals. Whereas in insulators, I do have a fully complete field uh, balance band, um, empty conduction band, but a high energy gap or a big energy gap. Whereas in semiconductors, so basically, if we think about semiconductors and insulators, they actually have the same conditions. So fully filled balance band, empty conduction band, and the difference is the gap. The gap between these bands in semiconductors is not so huge. In insulators, it's a huge band. Okay? So, this is what we are looking at right now. This is actually the band structure of silicon, right? So, you have a balance band, see, fully filled of electrons. Then you have a gap, the energy gap, that is not a large gap, as in, in, in insulators. And then you have this conduction band that it's empty. If you guys remember, 
the electronic configuration of semiconductors, it goes as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and it finishes at 3p2, right? So actually, if we think um, how, how the electrons are filling these bands, you actually go, fill them as, as if you're pouring water in a glass. So I go and fill the lowest state until I have, you know, until I have completed the, the whole amount of electrons that I have, right? So remember the, the atomic number of silicon, for example, is, uh, what is it? I think it's is it, it's 16, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, or No, it's 14, I believe, yeah, it's 14. Um, so yeah, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2, yeah, it's, it's 14, okay. Yeah, so let's go and fill those states. So I will have, an S state, the one you see here, I'm going to go and fill that lowest S state. I go and occupy that state. Then I have the higher, I have the P state. I see, due to the band structure, I see no gap between the S and the P state. So I fill the S state and then I go and fill the next higher P state. So this one. Then I keep filling. I see another P state. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go and fill it as well. Go and fill that P state. And then go and fill the other, and sorry, and fill the other P state. So I go and fill this first S and these three first P states. And then I actually run out of electrons because it, it happens that I have only 14 in, in sorry, in, in silicon. So I, I have filled all these uh, levels and my valence band becomes fully occupied. So all of those four electrons, remember that I have four valence electrons in silicon, for example, or any other metal in group four of the periodic table. All of those four NA, is NA just means number of atoms. It will obviously depend on the number of atoms I have but per atom I have four electrons, right? All those four electrons are accommodated now. So all those four electrons in the balance band. Per obviously atom, right? Now, if I go and see the graph, this highest P state, the one right there, actually doesn't touch with any of the bands in the conduction band with any of the states in the conduction band. So if I go actually go and see these energy bands, they don't touch, they don't touch anything on the balance band. So I do have an energy gap, right? Because I have my highest P state in the balance band and then I have the lowest P state in the conduction band. But then that is empty now, right? This, I have no electrons in the conduction band in, in semiconductors. And I have, therefore, because obviously these bands don't touch among themselves, I have this energy gap, right? So that's just the, the band structure. <clears throat> Actually, if we if we think on what materials uh, show this behavior, will be any material that have covalent bonds, right? They will have in common these hybrid bands. So these bands that I occupy, well, all the valence bands are occupied, and the conduction bands are empty. So I have no electrons there. And this energy gap, I, I believe actually um, Brian showed us a, a couple of, of minutes ago uh, that that table at the end of the presentation. 
actually the gap energy, so this, this value here, decreases in group four, so just talking about silicon, germanium, and all those, uh, it actually decreases with increasing atomic number. So the higher the atomic number, the lower the energy gap will be. And that's why, uh, for example, uh, Brian was talking that, or was saying that germanium is a better candidate for, for semi, for solar panels, but obviously it's uh, part of, of semiconductor materials, uh, because it has a lower energy gap, right? And, and that is a rule, actually. If we go in the periodic table, it will, uh, the higher the atomic number, the lower the energy gap. That's why germanium has a higher atomic number than silicon. It has a, um, it's more or a lower energy gap than silicon, okay? So that's the key, right? Full balance band, empty conduction band, and the energy gap. So that means this um, space between the highest bands in the conduction band, sorry, the lowest bands in the conduction band and the highest bands in the balance band. There is no overlap, therefore I have that energy gap. Uh, oops, wait, uh, what happened? Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Why is the conduction band empty? I have no electrons there because I have um, no electrons. Is, is it related to the graph that is in the right part of the slide? Yeah, yeah, this. I mean, that's 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 the graph I was I was explaining. I I, I basically I have electrons. Electrons come here. Okay, they occupy the AS state. Then they they go and occupy the first higher uh, p state. Then this is just for silicon, right? I mean, I have. If I have another material, the electronic configuration will change. Therefore, the band, the band graph will change, but the principle is the same. I have um, a specific number of electrons, so electrons will come here, okay, occupy the first S state. Then it comes and occupies the first P state. Then it comes and occupies the second P state. And then it comes and occupies the third P state. And oops, sorry, I have no more electrons to occupy. So sorry, you, the conduction band get, is empty. So the the lines must be in a loop. I mean, they they must be all connected. The energy distribution. I, I don't understand what you mean by the lines. By I mean the, in the uh, I mean in the graph yeah. below the energy band, all yeah. the those lines are kind of connected. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, there shouldn't be a, a space. There is an, a beginning. And there is an end. For each level, S, P, P, P. Yeah. But in the case of the conduction band, the S line uh, has no end. So that means that well, means that it's empty. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, well, not not really. I mean, that that's just because basically you cut the graph, right? There will be because uh -huh. if you if you actually plot the full graph, you actually have. Remember, if you remember, I think yeah, in module one or is it, is is it in this module that we have? You have. Know. Remember, I show the full graph of, of the silicon band structure. Remember there was that huge graph and I actually showed for, for uh, three or four different materials. Uh, there, there will be an end. I mean, there will be a, a point where S will be here and then you will have another band there and another band there. But that just means that in the conduction, well, it's just that in con the conduction band, you don't have electrons just because just because of the electronic configuration. So you go and, and go and feel, okay, I feel the S, um, the S band. I go and feel the P band. I go and feel this other P band. I go and feel this other P band. And then I have no more electrons to feel. So I, I, I want to feel, I want to go and feel this P band in the conduction band or this P state. But it just happens that I don't have more electrons to go and feel them. So my production band is empty. It's literally like, okay, I have these electrons. Okay, I'm gonna go and put them in order. So I go and order uh, like step by step. First state, second state, go and fill that state, go and fill that state. Oh, well, I run out of electrons. Okay, stop there. I'm sorry. That's it. Okay. 
Thanks. Um. So let's talk about two types of semiconductors, and let's focus on the first. Let's focus on uh, intrinsic semiconductors. Semiconductors usually at, at low temperatures, uh, they are not insu they are insulators, sorry, because they behave. Remember, it's the same band structures and insulators. So, full balance band, empty conduction band, energy gap between them. So, like insulators. Okay, what happens at elevator okay, at elevated uh, temperatures so at high temperatures? Well. I will have or I will start inducing vibrations that will start exciting the electrons that are here to jump. And because this energy gap is not so huge like in insulators where that band, that gap is like huge that you can jump. Well, here, because I obviously go high temperatures, I start in the, uh, sorry, I, I start to, to induce this movement so I can excite electrons and I can give them enough energy so they can jump. It's like a bridge that they're jumping and they go and jump into here because the gap is not so huge. So it's like having a bridge of, let's say, one meter versus having a bridge of one kilometer, right? Obviously, you can jump if, if you have a, a huge gap. Um, so, it's basically in intrinsic semiconductors, literally the mechanism of conduction, first of all, I have to be at high temperatures, high enough so I can, and high enough meaning actually um, room temperature or just above room temperature, right? Um, so I can excite my electrons. Right, I can give them that extra energy due to the uh, thermal induced energy that I'm putting in the material. I'm exciting um, and I'm helping those electrons to jump. Sorry, from the balance band. Oh, sorry, from the balance band to the conduction band. And so now those electrons that go to the conduction band, they help or they contribute to electrical conductivity and also those electron holes. Because imagine if I have, um, okay, that's my conduction band and that is my balance band, okay? So I have an electron here, right? I have it full of electrons here and I have empty, up there is empty, right? So let's say this electron comes and jumps, right, from here to here, right? Now I have this electron here, and now I, ha I don't have this electron there. But that actually, that hole that lives there, that is left there because of that jump, also contributes to electrical conduction. So it's not just that the electron jump to the conduction band, and obviously that helps for electrical conduction, but also because now I don't have a full balance band, well, that also helps to electrical conduction because I have a hole there. It's like literally a space that helps me also or allows also to electrons to move here. Because here, it will, before, it was so full that nobody could move. Now, because I have a hole, now I can move. Right? And now it, it basically becomes a metal. Well, not exactly, but it becomes a metal. Remember, that's why if you go back to, to, to first module or I think the beginning of this module, if you go back and remember the, the band structure of a metal, what we have is a partially filled balance band. And that's actually why they are good conductors, because the balance band is not full. So electrons are able to move freely in the balance band, right? in the balance band. Okay. So that's, that's important. Um, okay, and so obviously, right, if electron, let's say, if, if the electron, the electrons will, will actually move uh, in the same direction as the electric field, right? So let's say I have an external electric field generated, so okay, my electron will come and move 
Uh, let me go uh, through it. So, and, and this is actually a nice concept. So let's say electrons go and move that in that in that direction. And we actually consider the holes as particles. And that is, well, part of quantum mechanics, right? Actually that hole that is left behind in the valence band is actually considered like a particle. And that hole actually will move or migrate in the opposite direction of the electron. So if the external field is moving, let's say, to the right of the screen, right, and the electron will move to the right of the screen, then the hole will move towards the left of the screen. And so I have an increase in conduction because I have electrons that jump um, it to the conduction band and that are moving in the same direction as the electric field, and I have holes moving in the valence band in the opposite direction of the electron. And that, en that energy that is needed for that excitation and for this movement comes from thermal energy, comes from increasing the temperature. Is this clear so far? So now let's actually talk about um, Fermi energies. The probability for a state in the valence band of an intrinsic semiconductor, so let's talk, intrinsic just means it's not dope, okay? It doesn't have any additional, so let's say it's pure silicon, okay? Um, of an intrinsic semiconductor, when T, I, is zero Kelvin. The probability for being occupied is actually 100%, right? Because we're saying that if we're at zero Kelvin, right, where there is no thermal energy, well, the valence band will be fully occupied because that's the band structure of semiconductors. So my probability, so the, the distribution function, remember, will be one. when E is lower than the, let's say, the energy of the valence band, right? So up to there, up to here, if you see, that's all one. So fully occupied valence band. However, if I go higher to higher temperatures, so I start, remember, giving that thermal energy, okay, those electrons that are at the top of the valence band, so let's say those electrons that are in that region, right? they will be excited. They will say, okay, I have enough energy now. I'm going to go and jump into the conduction band. So they go and jump into the conduction band. And therefore, the probability right, of finding an electron, remember, that's, a, that's, a, that's f of e, right? It's just the, the function that tells me the probability of finding an electron. Um, well, it will be reduced. Because now I have electrons that have jumped to the conduction band, so therefore my probability is not longer one, it actually will decrease. In, sorry, in the valence band. Now, the opposite happens in the conduction band, right? When t equals zero, my probability is fully zero, you see? Um, I have zero probability if I will be at, at, at temperature zero, my probability will be zero. In, at, in the conduction band, because I have no electrons there. But if I increase the temperature, right, I know that my probability won't be zero, because I will have electrons jumping to the conduction band, and therefore I will have more chances to find an electron in the conduction band. Therefore, where is the Fermi energy? Well, the Fermi energy is actually located in the center of the forbidden band. So the Fermi energy is right there, right in the middle of the energy gap. So that means for intrinsic semiconductors, for intrinsic semiconductors, the Fermi energy equals the energy gap divided by two.
So remember the Fermi energy is that energy which uh, basically tells me, and remember this concept, right? The Fermi energy is just the energy um, at which the Fermi distribution function, so f of v, equals a half. And that actually happens in intrinsic semiconductors in the middle of the energy gap. So now, now I just want to make this clear. This doesn't mean that I'm going to find an electron at the energy gap. In the gap, I have no electrons there. Definitely, I'm not going to have any electrons there. This is only comparing the probability of, um, remember, finding an electron at a given energy point, right? But definitely in, in the band, in the energy gap, sorry, I won't have any electrons, right? It's just that the Fermi energy, well, due to this distribution, um, happens to be located or happens to be equal to a half of the energy gap, right? Or in the middle point of this, um, transition of the Fermi distribution function. Remember, right? The Fermi distribution function is just the probability of occupancy of an available energy state, okay? Doesn't mean that I will find electrons there in the energy gap. Just that to make sure you guys are clear on that. Um, okay. Any questions? You can so see in, the, in, in the first case, when the temperature is zero Kelvin, the electrons, yeah, uh, the probability to the probability to find uh, electron in the balanced band is one. But okay, when the probability of occupancy. The probability of occupancy, uh, ah, okay. the probability of occupancy of that energy state. Okay, yeah, but but when temperature is greater than than zero Kelvin, uh, in this case, the probability to the electrons are in the conduction band is different to zero. That, that is uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, no. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, electrons will start jumping to to the conduction band, and obviously, I, I won't have a probability of, of occupancy uh, of zero because now I do I know that that state, that energy state. So remember, this is just energy, right? These are levels of energy. Yeah. Um, but this graph, uh, we just in, in the in the middle of uh, between zero and, and one in the x-axis or fa yeah. a, is the, the case at the temperature is greater than zero kelvin or or temperature is zero kelvin no no all he's saying is how distribution is how this how the distribution is changing right so how this ah, okay. this function is changing in terms of energy so i i have no temperature in the graph in the graph i have no temperature um in so but 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 I, I i i i must be cognizant and say wait okay when when am i gonna have this well i'm gonna have this this one this probability of one in in the balance band and this probability of zero in the conduction band i'm gonna have it when t equals zero i know i know that if i'm not at t equals zero well my probability won't be one in the balance band, and my probability won't be zero in the conduction band. That's why I'm saying this here, this especially this part, because this this may get you confused, guys, because you may say, wait, so I have probability of occupancy in the energy gap? No, definitely the energy gap must be always empty, right? That's why it's an energy gap. All this telling me, all this is telling me is just, or I guess it, it's, it's just a way to, to help me understand where the Fermi energy will be located. And, and I know, okay, the Fermi energy will be located halfway through the energy gap. But it doesn't mean, um, so if I were to plot, let's say at a higher temperature, what it will look like, 
will be something like this, right? It will be like, okay, I won't have a zero probability or probably have, let's say here is zero. I probably have this, right? Or maybe it will be actually like this. And then, uh, okay, I'll have something like that, right? But I will always have the energy gap. I will always have the energy gap. And I won't have a one as probability, right? Let's say one is here, okay? I probably have a lower probability. No problem. I'll, I'll definitely have a lower probability. But this this graph is not intending to show, so especially this part, this middle part, is not really intending to, to tell me, oh, wait, so I actually have a probability of occupancy at the energy gap? No, no, not really. No. It's just a way of showing you where the Fermi energy is located. And then this, well, this is showing you, okay, what happens at zero Kelvin? That That's definitely true at zero Kelvin. You will have one or probability of one um, or in the balance band and a probability of zero in the conduction band. If you go to higher temperature, well, that will be shifted. This will move towards the right and this will move towards the left. You guys agree on that? Yes, mister. Yeah. Okay. Um, you remember this equation? If not, go back to the to the slides. Okay. I maybe I think it was module one or maybe this module. Um, we really need to know what the number of electrons in the conduction band is, right? We really want to know what the number of electrons in the conduction band is. So and, and you know that if we are if we, if we are at the high temp at high temperatures, that number is going to be high as long as my energy gap is small, like happen like in semi in semiconductors. Well, I will have a lot of electrons jumping and, and being present in the conduction band, and so I really need to know what that number is, or it will be useful to know what that number is, right? So, and, and you can think that already that that number of electrons in the conduction band is definitely a function of that energy gap because if the energy gap is small i know i will have an, a higher number of electrons there and also temperature right it will be a function of temperature the higher the temperature the more electrons i will have in the conduction band so you can definitely i guess uh, understand that right um and so we, we're gonna try to get an expression to get the number of electrons in the conduction band based on what we've learned so far and based on these concepts. So remember, this is just um, okay, the number of electrons and, and just that's just differential. That's an equation we, we already derived, or we already saw at least. And remember, that is the um, population density, right? Population density is just two times what? Two times the density of states times the Fermi distribution function. So if you remember, that was density of states, and this was the Fermi distribution function, how it looked like, right? Um, and if you remember, or in actually, if you consider now, we know this, right? We know that that will actually be about 0 0.5 electron volts from the graph before, because remember that the Fermi energy is halfway through the, the, the gap. In this value, at room temperature, will be quite small, will be like 10 to the negative two, right? So actually this term will be huge compared to this plus one. So we can actually eliminate that plus one, or I guess approximate our expression, eliminating that plus one because the, the exponential term would be a lot, a lot bigger than one. So plus one won't have a major influence, so I can approximate my Fermi distribution function with that. So if I combine these equations, all these equations, and I integrate, so I integrate this and that, and combining, obviously, so N of E, I have that, and I, I know for set of E is this, and F of E is that. If I combine them and integrate them, it will look something like this, right? I'm going to integrate from zero to infinity, because that's basically all electrons, all, all available electrons that have energies larger than the energy 
at the bottom of the conduction band. Right? So I integrate all this, I solve, and I will get something like this. And I'm going to stop there because it's already 11.02 and I need to run to my other class. But um, okay, I'll, I'll finish this class on Wednesday. Okay, and then yeah, I guess we'll get ready for the exam next week. Actually, let me see when when is the exam, guys? Uh, ha, ha, ha. Exam is next. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Okay, so I I I gotta talk to you guys. Um, I can't make it at eleven a.m. Um, because I I'll be traveling. So. Can you guys, can we guys move it to 1 p.m. to be safe? If not, in the afternoon, and if not, at night. Whatever guy, whatever time you guys prefer, but please tell me now, as long as it's after 1 p.m. so I can be there. Otherwise, you guys can go at 11 a.m. and be there, but I won't be there. So you guys just answer your, the questions, but if you have any questions regarding the questions, I won't be able to answer. Um, yeah, sir, we were thinking about if you could move it to Thursday. Tuesday, we have previous to your exam, I guess. Um, polymers exam. Oh, OK, so you want to move it to Thursday? Yeah, if, if you're OK with us. Uh, whoa, ah. Thursday is Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. OK. Um, yeah, I guess what time will it be? Morning? Mm, whatever time is best for you. Yeah, we could do it morning. the same, if same it, time. If it's, okay. if it's in the if it's in uh, morning, yeah, that's much better. So let's say 9, 10 a.m., even 11 a.m. Not after okay. that. So sure. let's leave it at 10 a.m. Is 10 a.m. okay for everyone? Thursday, 10 a.m. Yes. Everyone agrees, yeah, guys? Okay. For Thumbs me, up. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move right now that. Uh, so Tuesday, I'm going to change it to Thursday. Okay, so that's actually better for all of us. Okay, great. So Thursday, 10 a.m. Okay, Thursday, November 25th, 10 a.m. Okay, guys, that's it. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, sir. Thank you. Bye, teacher.